Australian team jumpers. of Outerage and Outerage just sending it and in place. A great upwind for those guys, really solidifying that great start. Guide set by uh, by the race by the race leader Langer at their mark, and Outerage carries on. Nathan and Haley Outridge finished second at the NACRA 17 World Championships in Geelong at the start of 2020. Hi, my name's Andy Rice from SailJuice.com. I'm in the UK and joining me now from the other side of the world, from Auckland, New Zealand, is none other than Nathan Outridge himself. So Nathan, great to have you on the line. Thanks for joining me. No worries. Thanks for the chat. It's nice to have something to do while we're all locked inside. Yeah, well, it, it is strange times, and um, in terms of um, Geelong, it really wasn't that long ago, but uh, it, it probably feels like a whole other lifetime ago now, doesn't it? Yeah, well, that was only February, so we're only talking about six weeks ago that we were we were there all racing, and um, you know, there's, there's a lot that's happened since then. I think that people are never going to forget in their lives with this COVID nineteen um, pandemic. So. Yeah, I never would have expected that that would potentially be the one and only NACRA regatta for the season. The other strange thing, I'm sure the thing at the top of your mind in terms of uh, natural disasters and um, uh, man's relationship with the, this world that we live on is probably more the bushfires that were ravaging Australia at the time. Um, so, so tell us about that because I, I'm thinking that was probably higher in your thoughts than uh, COVID-19 at the time. Yeah, well, Australia's had it pretty tough of late, you know, with all those bushfires that were going throughout um, the entire country. Normally, every summer in Australia, there is some form of bushfire um, issue or concern, but these bushfires kicked off in August, which was winter. Um, so, yeah, the whole summer, um, Australia was just covered in smoke and um, they were, you know, cancelling racing down in Melbourne prior to the world for smoke pollution and, and visibility and people were wearing you know masks then for other reasons for for smoke now people are wearing masks for you know this infectious disease so um it's it's been a really strange few months and when you're a, a competitive athlete you know trying to really um focus on a very small part of the world or your life um you cannot realise these other things are happening in the background. But, you know, when you're in Australia, it was obvious that the bushfires were a huge concern for for the entire country and, and the emissions that were coming out of that were, you know, taking, you know, people around the world were taking notice of the, you know, the carbon emissions that were coming out of all these fires. And just as those fires became under control because of basically the weather changed and there was a bit, fair bit of rain throughout February, um, there's another issue that's, you know, causing problems, you know, worldwide. So, you know, I never thought at that time I'd be sitting in my house here in Auckland, uh, not able to go anywhere at all. Crazy. So uh, sort of looking on the bright side, I, I guess there was, a, there was a small gap of sunlight between those two clouds and the NACRA 17 World Championships just about managed to fit in that narrow window between the end of the bushfires and and the start of the coronavirus pandemic. I mean, looking back on it, I guess the timing was quite fortunate. It was, and, and you know, obviously, um, you know, we weren't aware, but the, the pandemic, you know, had already begun in China. And I, I've been doing some research to try and understand what was actually going on in the world at that time, you know, we were down in Geelong, and um, they'd already shut down Wuhan City. But in Australia, we were, we were naive, the entire world was still a bit naive about it. And we were just going yachting and having a great time and, um, you know, I have some great memories of, of the weeks that we spent there and that event. And, um, you know, it might be my only memories of sailing for, for 2020. Yeah, that's a, that's a strange way of looking at it, but you, you may, you may well be spot on. I, I, uh, I fear to say, and, and sort of reluctantly agree with you. Um, anyway, let's, let's go back to those happier times. Yeah. And <laughs> Good. I've asked you to identify a particular race. So just to set up the scene for us, um, what were you, you and Haley, aiming to achieve out of these world championships? Well, I think like anyone who goes to a world championships, their, their ultimate goal is to win the world. You know, 
obviously we had some Olympic selection that was riding on that event. But, um, you know, if you want to go to the Olympics, you basically have to be the best in the world. If you're the best in the world, how can they not send you to the Olympics? So our, our target, our goal for Geelong was, you know, let's, let's tackle this as, as the big one-off event. It's the high-pressure event and let's um, focus on winning. So that was our goal. And, and this race that I think we're going to have a look at was about midway through the Worlds. Um, and it was, it was a uh, – the Geelong was an interesting place, you know, when it comes to – sailing it was a very flat water venue a lot of times we had wind off the land so a bit shifty and um there was quite a lot of weed so there's there's quite a lot that happened in this race that probably wasn't really looked at or discussed too much well it's going to be great to get your insight from uh, from that point of view uh we're 36 seconds out from the start of this race um Nathan, how much do you remember about the specifics leading into the start of race nine of these world championships? Quite a bit. It was a quite an important day because we'd, we'd done obviously a few races by this point and we were on the morning session this day and we had um, a, a light um, land breeze, like a northerly. So we had basically a breeze that was dying and we got two races in. The first race was extremely erratic, race seven. It was very shifty. And then when we went into race eight, it got very, very light, like hardly couldn't fly a hull upwind and just foiling downwind at times. And then we we did race nine and it was a a flop. It was basically it got abandoned because there was no wind. And then we sat it there for over an hour waiting for the sea breeze to come. And so this race, we start at the very building phase of the sea breeze. And interestingly, the right-hand side has you know, good 12, 14 knots sea breeze. And in the far left corner, there's about four or five knots of wind. And right up the center of the course or right in the bottom gate, there was a massive weed stack that had basically accumulated there because the wind had sort of been swirling through this hour. So basically, um, there was, a, in my opinion, it was a very clear one-way track that needed to be executed um, straight away out of the start with an early tack. And if you did that, you'd, you'd obviously leg out on the fleets. So um, I think you can see us, we're at the, the far left of this picture, um, racking up for a windward end start here. Right, okay. So you're getting the start that you want at, these, at this stage, 30 seconds to go. Um, what's the conversation between you and Haley right now? Well, basically, you, get, yeah, you can look at the line there. No one wants to go left, everyone wants to go right. So you, you're trying to judge the leeway of the fleet and if you're going to get a gap between the boat and like the start boat and the fleet so we were out to the right wanting to get an early tack but if you're too late in the train everyone starts and then you can't get a lane to tack on but i think we managed to judge the 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 leeway drift and you won't see us here at the moment but you'll see pretty soon they switch and you can see we're almost one of the first boats to get onto port tack it's funny you see how much pin and bias there was but how no one down here is even trapezing We'd be on port tack right now, um, twin wiring, I would say. So it's a big pe- pressure difference across the course. So, so if this was in displacement keel boats, that Norwegian port tack start might have worked. Yes, but it, it was only ever going to work if you could cross the entire fleet and get to the new pressure first. Right. See how all the boats on the right? I think you can see where the furthest pushed out boat there on port um, and, and Norway are now going to be a good 25 boats behind us. And there you are in the lead on the leaderboard already. I know you don't put much store by these kind of things at this stage, but anyway, it's not going too badly for you to be listed as as top of the leaderboard, top left of our picture right now. Yeah, exactly. And I think the thing that happened a lot in, in Geelong and in every event um, is that, you know, with the fleet, you know, we raced in one fleet, so we had quite a lot of boats. So you, you always need options to go where you want to go and you need to have a pretty clear plan and, you know, if, if you lead the left pack here and the right pack wins, you're going to be at best mid-fleet. Um, so we were, we were pretty punchy a lot with our decisions off the line, always trying to make sure we were going uh, the way we thought was, was best. And, um, you know, you can see that <clears throat> the French are out there um, with us, but, you know, they're also looking at some teams on this side of the course that are actually looking quite good. But what the tracker, you know, what this tracker isn't showing right now is that 
when you're on port, you're just selling to more and more pressure out on the right hand side and um, made a huge difference um, in the end. And what was also happening is the wind was not only stronger on the right hand side of the track, but it kept, you know, shifting to the right. So we were leading the group out there. Um, and it's all about now trying to work out where do you tack for the ley line? Because, you know, you don't want to put yourself in the corner. You want to leave yourself some options for if it shifts a bit. Um, and at this point in the regatta too, you know, one of our big top competitors that we were trying to beat was Gimpson and Burnett. You know, they were having a cracker of an event. And so we knew we were in good shape if we were, you know, at least sticking close to them um, and managing, you know, the points. Because you, once you get halfway through the event, you start looking at points a little bit more than what you do, say, at the beginning. Yeah. Um I mean, this wasn't a particularly relevant race course in terms of what people would expect in Enoshima, flat water and so forth. Well, actually, you, you can tell me, may, maybe those offshore conditions in Enoshima, maybe this would be relevant racing. Well, yeah, in Enoshima, there's, there's three sort of types of weather. You know, there's the, the typical windier kind of sea breeze, which brings that um, massive chop to almost swell. You know, it's quite big and it's what you'd call non-foiling conditions for these knackers. But then 30% of the time you're going to get wind off the land. That can be quite shifty and it, it makes, you know, what we're doing here quite relevant. But then there's also those days that are quite light. So I look at the 60% of the chance of wind and waves. There's 30% chance probably of um, off the land and shifty. And then the remaining percentage, which isn't much, is, is really light, like below seven knots. Okay. Now, at this stage, Koloff and Stuhlema from Germany are listed and then Gibbs and Weiss from uh, USA. You're nominally down in six, now up to fourth. There's, there's basically nothing in it. We're, we're looking at Gibbs and Weiss at the moment. Um, when you're looking at competitors like this, I know you're a fan of analysing things on video. What are you seeing here? Oh, when you look at the onboard stuff, you're just looking at their techniques. You're looking at, you know, if if you look at how much bow they're pushing through the water, it gives you an indication on how much lift they're running on the foil. So clearly they're not even attempting to, to foil here at all. They're just running low drag. You can see Riley's pulling on the cano quite a lot. He's flicking it on and off, really controlling the power. The the NACRO, which is which I learned, is very different to a 49er in that, you know, the crew's on the main sheet in both boats. But in a 49er, the crew controls all the power. You know, they're on the vein, on the Cunningham all the time. Whereas in the NACRA, the helms are always on the Cunningham and they're always, you know, taking the power out, putting the power back in. And the Cunningham is, is very powerful in terms of how you sail the boat. You can change the power very aggressively and change the modes very aggressively. So it's, it's definitely a, a big um, tool and it took it took me a while to get my head around the fact that that's probably almost more important than the main sheet. It sounds and, like um, it is the main sheet, effectively. Well, it is. Yeah, the main sheet's the Vang, right? You know, if right. you compare it to a conventional boat, and and the Cunningham is is just controlling the depth of the sail and how much twist you want to run. And so, it's it's a it's a real interesting combination. You see the Greek boat here, massive heel. Yeah. That's not intentional. That's that's trying to work out how much weed they've got on their foils. Oh, right. Okay. And so, you know, it frustrated me a lot watching the racing back and hearing commentators always talk about, oh, there's, um, you know, they're out of control, you know, going downwind. It's like, no, I've just got 50% of my foil covered in weed and I'm trying to get rid of it. Um, so that, that was a big problem. And so you, your whole time you're just working out as a percentage how much weed you have on your foils and, and how much you want to get rid of. So just looking at this graphic here, it looks interesting. See how we've all tacked before the ley line? And, yep. you know, we look like we're in a very strong position now. The the, the um, track is probably starting to be a bit more real in terms of positions overall. Yeah. And and we basically got a header out towards the corner and tacked and thought we'd get under the shift and, and get a nice lift and then at some point at the top just do a little chip back. But what we're seeing is... Um, you know, especially Santi, who's out on our right a bit more, and even um, the Italians there, they're, they're lifting up inside us. They're getting slightly more pressure. And so what we had was quite a good lead of 50 metres. 
the further we go across here, the more the inside boats are winding up on you. And so you're always trying to work out at this point, um, is that shift going to come back my way and we'll, we'll tack and, and get across them then or do I need to concede now and, and get out there and, and get some of that pressure? How do you and, work um, out what kind of shift is going to happen? You just got to use your eyes and you've got to go off past experience, right? So past experience was what were we doing the half an hour before this race? Well, every time I went out to the right on a practice up wind with Haley, we were always saying we were getting big right-hand pressure. So lifting and so you could really wind up around the, the shore, the headland that you can see in the distance there. Um, so we so thought we got a, a, a ripper of a, a shift. So with that in mind, and you got that experience half an hour beforehand, why do you let the Argentinians get so far to the right of you? Well, they tacked about four lengths on our hip, and I thought, well, that's not too much leverage, but then they hooked into more of it than what we had. Like where we are now, in hindsight, we should have just gone and waited for everyone else to tack, but I think we just wanted to to get in phase because I thought, oh, there could be a left-hand shifty. So now you can see what I'm talking about that, the Italians tacked almost on our line and they got up to there. Santi went even further and got even more of a shift. And so right now we're trying to work out when's our moment to get back over there and you can see more and more boats stacking up on the starboard lay. This is us doing a little weed clear before the tack. Okay, and do you know that you have weed or are you, are you checking to see if you do have weed? Well, it's pretty hard because the foils are black, right? And the weed's black or brown. So it's hard to tell, but you can feel the performance of the boat drop. So we'll do a bit of a heel on the exit to just check what's on this board. You can upwind, you can really only clear the windward foils um, when you're sailing in a straight line. So you, you do an aggressive hull flight it to clear it. Um, but then what you'll also see is some people doing back down tacks. So literally putting the boat in irons on purpose in a tack to do a reverse to get your weed off to get going again. Um, so how much did you find yourself doing that during these worlds? It was, it was a very important thing. You know, we were doing it as often as we could. Whenever we felt like we were slow relative to the fleet, we, you'd have to do a weed clear. So here you go. We obviously got a nice little lefty um, to get back across. So we, we gave up basically one position here to Santi. But I think Santi's running a bit of weed right now. You can see he's really pushing a lot of water there. Okay. And so, um, you know, right now it's a tough call. It's like if you know you've got weed on, do you do a back down tack so that you can actually go fast downwind or do you, you hold your position and accept that you might not be very quick downwind? It's a, it was stressing a lot of people out, that's for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, do you think that in the end, uh, the right people finished in the right place? Bearing in mind that you only missed out on the world title by a point. This is your opportunity for a bit of sour grapes. Do you think that, <laughs> do you think that uh, when, when the margins were so tight that we might have decided some of the positions? I think that early in the event that was catching some of the top teams out with the weed. But I think after a while, everyone, you know, worked out the tactic for getting it off. And if you look at the top 10, they were still the same top 10 that are pretty much always there. So I don't think it really made a huge difference. Some people definitely adapted better than others. So just focusing on this rounding, like knowing that it was a right-hand track, it's a really tough call. Are you going to do a jibe set, which we all know is a slow manoeuvre, or are you going to set get it ripping and then jive back down through the pressure. And um, obviously different strategies here is if you can do a really good bear away foiling and hoist while foiling and then snap the kite and then roll into a jibe. So therefore you've gone 150, 200 meters straight before you jibe, then you make an early gain versus the guys that do the two hulls in jibe set. Also remembering you're going through a wind shot of the entire fleet. And so, you know, whenever this happens, I always think about what's the highest percentage manoeuvre, what's the easiest thing to pull off. You can see that Santi's going for the jibe set and we're up and foiling here and, and ripping. So we, we do a small split and Haley goes in and gets the kite up here. And one advantage to being a bigger helm is you can keep it on the foil during the hoist. It, it makes life hard for Haley being the little one doing all the hard work on the crew. But, um, yeah, everyone here basically jibes and now we just roll into our jibe there. So you might look at that and think, phew, it's a risk, but 
I, I would have thought that, you know, we would have made it a reasonable gain there. But as it turns out, the further you get down the run, the pressure just keeps coming more and more, more down that side. So it's, um, it's a tough call. You see here Riley and, and um, Anna doing their job. So you, you think you probably did make the gain at the point of the hoist, uh, but it just didn't put you tactically in the right position for further down the course. Yeah, we made a short-term gain, and then you, and then it's a question of well, what what go, is going to pan out further down the run. And um, you can see us, we're way down there to lure there on the right with the white spinnaker. So um, if they run out of pressure and start lifting and need to jibe, then we're going to be in good shape. But as it pans out, it's it's this race is is a, very much a one-way track, so it comes down a lot to your boat speed and positioning. But what? you're always thinking now is, okay, well, what are we going to do for lap two? You know, there's not much you can really do with your spots and positions now, but how do we, you know, convert this into a, how do we basically maintain our spot? Where are the gains and losses going to come? Look at that heel there. Whoa, is that, is that you healing over there? Uh, that's, that's the American team, I think, and they're clearing weed when that happens. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's phenomenal how far people will heal over to to clear well it's just amazing how far you've got to heal to get the foils out of the water you know to get that windward board and rudder out of the water you've got to go like 35 degrees of heel what's the boat speed difference would you say with a big clump of weed compared with none um so we kind of thought tolerating 20 percent or 25 percent of the foil with weed on was okay that's only a maybe a one to one and a half knot speed drop but if you're at 50 percent of the foils particularly the the more horizontal parts of your foil, you'd you'd be looking at um, you know, four knots. And if it was lighter, you you'd struggle to even foil. Okay. And um, you know, it's it's a huge loss. So what happens is, is the further you get down the run, you just slowly collect bit little bit by little bit by little bit. And um by the bottom, sometimes you can hardly keep the thing on the foil. No way. So your worry now is um um, oh, sorry, that's yeah, that's Argentina. I thought we were looking at you. Well, that's Argentina and Italy just jibed on to starboard, and we are we're not we're not too far off their tail right now. They've they've made a small gain on us, and so now you know these guys are very close to ley line. Most of the time, people go to ley line in the class unless it's very shifty. But you know it's expensive to overlay, but an underlay is not too bad because an extra jibe isn't isn't the end of the world. And uh, you can see, yeah, we, we're coming down here on starboard. So we decide to jibe on the inside of the group, just ahead of the, the British there. Um, because it's really hard to judge, you know, how close you are on ley line. And I think what you see happening now is the fleet starting to bunch up because the leaders are at the front of the gust and the tail, you know, not the tail enders, but the guys in the top 10 are now bringing down new pressure. And so right now it's all about how do we, how do we position ourselves to go right again up the next upwind? Yes, there's little battles going on here, but the overall goal is how do I get a clear lane on port out of the bottom gate? That's all we're thinking. Okay. Um, and what would you be your ideal exit if you're leading? Well, ideally, ideally, you'd be leading around the, the left-hand mark looking downwind to, to get out onto to port. But, you know, if you're not first, you, you need to – react to the other teams you know so you can see now it's getting a bit choppier and Santi's having a couple of drops off drop offs and he's obviously got weed on because the Italians have just sailed straight past him okay so you know the you, you can keep the boat ripping here right now or you can decide oh that's us with the white cut so we're, we're still in the hunt and that's the British just behind us there so the fleet's compressing and so now it's all about trying to find your your gate mark exit so I think if you can't take the, the favoured mark and lead everyone out to the right, well, then your next best option is to probably take the other mark and get onto port early and be on everyone's hip and get yeah. along that way. Um, now, speaking to Vittorio Bissaro recently, he, he was saying that it was Tita and Banti, the Italians looking here, who really pioneered a lot of um, aggressive body movement along the gunnel downwind. Would you agree with that, that they sort of pioneered that technique? Yeah, they, they led the class for almost two years. You know, they won pretty much every event when I began in the class in 2018. They they beat us at the Worlds in um, Aarhus by a point and they pretty much won every other event they competed in. And uh, there was a lot of research into what they were doing and what, you know, other teams needed to do to catch them. But for sure, they 
you know, pioneers probably a good word. They were the ones who really worked hard on pushing the boat downwind and foiling in conditions that were very difficult. And um, here they go, they're rolling into attack there now. And yeah, the, the, we've just been chasing them ever since. And I think the fleet has now caught up to them because they haven't haven't been as dominant as they've been in the past. That's for sure. And as we speak now, we're under the coronavirus lockdown and uh, th those two top two Italian teams, both of whom have won a world championship, um, they still don't know which of them are going to go to the games. Well, at least they've now got over a year to work that out. So it's, it probably is the best thing that ever happened to Italy, you know, not from a health point of view, but for at least their selection. They, they can wait much, much longer now to select a team. Um, yeah, you can see, you know, sorry, going back to the race here, you can see teams, you know, struggling for speed, you know, the British here not even trapezing. I suspect what's happening right now is these two teams, the Italy and, and the British, have got a lot of weed on and they haven't cleared it. And when we went round the bottom mark, we did a back down tack to clear the weed, which then allowed us to, to generate more power and, and get twin wiring. And you can see Santi there. He's got weed issues. Everyone is is got it doing have has the same issues. Um, so, how do you adjust your mindset <laughs> to that? Because you said that some dealt with it better than others. I think it's accepting that you have to take losses in order to take long term gains. So, if you if you're in a, in in a good position, you're more likely to take short term losses to reap the long term gains and. One thing I saw Gimpo doing really well at the beginning of the week was he'd often do a back down tack or he'd be clearing weed every minute and he might lose some time or some distance or a position or two, but then he'll just gain them back straight away once he's clear and free to go again. It reminded me a lot of when I sailed moths, you know, when you get weed on a moth on a boat that foils only, you can persist for, with it for a while and at some point you have to get rid of it. And a moth, you'd literally capsize the boat, pull it back up, the weed would be free, and then you, you're going four knots quicker again. And so um, I remember doing the, the moth nationals actually in Geelong um, in 2009. We had some issues with weed, so I was, you know, I was prepared for it. And when I sailed a moth worlds um, in, in Lake Macquarie, where I'm from, we also get weed issues there. And um, it's, it's all about knowing and feeling when you're fast and when you're slow and when to clear the weed and when to keep it. And it's just an element that most people don't really think about or consider when racing because it generally isn't a problem. But as soon as it becomes a problem, if you can learn and adapt to it and accept it, um, cause it can be extremely frustrating, you know, having to race with it. And I won and only race that we really weren't in the side of the top 10. We persisted too long with weed and um, crossed the finishing line and finally realised that we were carrying half of Port Phillip Bay around the course with us because we, we never stopped. And um, our coach, Harry, was like, but yesterday you were clearing every, like, you know, two minutes. What happened? And I'm like, oh, I think we just completely forgot. And the next two races we started clearing the weed routinely and we got two seconds. So right. that's the kind of difference it makes. Yeah. Oh, so frustrating. And the faster the boat, the more this stuff matters as well, right? Absolutely. The faster the boat goes, the more it matters. And, you know, in a 49er, to clear weed is, is much, much easier than, say, a, a NACRA because you can jump in and just pull the board up and push it back down um, in a tack or in a jibe or just in a straight line. And to clear the rudder, I used to pass the tiller to goobs and I'd go to the back and fish it off. It's not that simple when you've got four blades in the water, that's for sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so, so as you can see, like with the racing here, it is a little bit one-way track. And so where it's all about trying to pick your ley line out here now. And so this time, Santi tacks earlier than us. It's hard to pick up on these graphics, but he's already on starboard tack and we, you know, tack up on his hip expecting, okay, if we get a, a right-hand wind, then we're going to be in the gun position here. And if we end up overlaid, we can pop it up onto the foil and, and, and sort of reach over the top of the fleet. But so were, were you thinking, were you surprised that he tacked and sort of that you'd, you'd swap tactical positions compared with the first lap? We, we were. I thought when he tacked, I'm like, oh, he's gone a bit before lay. And as he tacked, we got a little lift. So I'm like, we'll just sail a little further and we'll tack on the next shift. 
And unfortunately, he must have tacked on one side of this puff and started lifting. And we were like on port sailing around the other side of it. And so, you know, in a, in a keel boat, this would have been quite disastrous for us because, you know, we just sailed so much extra distance than what he did. But in a NACRA, because you have the ability to go low mode or high mode and you have a very flat VMG kind of polar, we were able to sit out on the hip of him and, and the Americans here. And then eventually we got a bit of a right hand shift and we popped it up under the foil and, and we come, you know, right back into him here. But I think what happened a little bit further back in the race is with, um, you know, people banking hard on the right, some people like um, Micah here tacked a little bit earlier and he was able to, to sneak a few shifts and, and really make a few positions and get up into the top five. So that's uh, Micah, as in Micah Wilkinson. So then and we, Erica, yeah. Yeah, with Erica Dawson. Okay. And they've now been selected for New Zealand. They have. They had an, a very impressive event. I was, um, it was interesting. They teamed up just before we went to Japan to do all the, the Olympic test event stuff last year. And, you know, in their own words, they were rubbish. You know, they, they were really off the pace, um, had a long way to go. And, um, you know, by the time they got to Geelong, I was like, wow, it's impressive what a team can do within a six-month period. And, and I'd say of all the teams that are currently selected, they're probably the most happy that the Olympics has been pushed back a year because they've got all this extra time now to, to catch up to the fleet. You know, they've got a lot of, a lot of potential, those two, and I, I was really happy to see them um, do so well. Fantastic. Yes, I mean, that, I didn't think they were really in the frame a year ago. Um, Micah, a lovely guy, uh, done some commentary with him before on the Extreme Sailing Series, but d didn't see him coming along and uh, and taking the spot. But well done to him and Erica. It was a big um, shake-up throughout the whole Kiwi um, NACRA program last year, and um, they were the ones, I guess, who benefited the most from all of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so meanwhile, how are things shaping up for you now compared with the Argentinians? Well, right now I'm looking at this going, oh, Haley. I think they might lay the top mark. You know, it's a, it's a long time across here and Haley's like, oh, there's no way they're going to lay. Like surely there'll be a little left-hand shift and we'll get them at the end. And um, at this point you can see that all the tracks are starting to lift. Even Micah down to Lewis has got that, that wine and somehow Santi's picked the lay line from the corner, which is, is incredible. And right now we've decided, okay, uh, we've got to put the hammer down and get the boat going. And right now we're foiling, you know, the graphics aren't fantastic, but we are foiling and trying to reduce leverage to get in close. And um, unfortunately we just don't have enough. There you go. We're right on his hip now. We don't, didn't have enough um, speed basically to get over him. And now we're having, actually, it was really funny at this point here, I, I was shouting out to him saying, that's, that's an impressive ley line that you picked from the corner. And are he's like, what? I'm just like, how did you pick that? Are you, are, you, are you implying that Santi is lucky or good? No, I was saying that's, that's very impressive and uh, you know, hats off to you. You know, that was, that was very good to see. And he's like, yeah, you like that? How much fun is this? We should do more racing today. <laughs> so it's nice to have people in the class like that that you can have a nice friendly chat with in a world championship race. Meanwhile, trying to work out, you know, how he's trying to work out how to not let us pass and we're trying to work out how to pass him. But Santi and I go way back from um, Artemis days in the America's Cup working together and you can see here in the video we're, we're all healing and we're all trying to shake weed off so that we get going downwind. So as soon as one does it, the other boat does it. It was just reminds me of the story of the, the, Olymp of the, the world's was weed shaking. <laughs> So here you are again, hot on the heels of the Argentinians. What are you thinking now? Well, we're thinking, you know, we've, we're, we're both going to be jibe setting because that's clearly the, the best way for pressure. Um, so you can see the crews are getting off the, the trap nice and early to, to get in and get the hoist going. Um, so Santi jibes first and, and we just jibe and follow suit. Oh, no, we don't. We go a little bit and then we jibe. I think we're always, our, our mindset was always get the kite up before you jibe, um, which obviously opens up a bit of distance to lured. But um, it was just, we, I never felt very comfortable trying to get off the trapeze while bearing away and jibing on a foiling boat. We, we had many capsizes um, in training trying to pull off that manoeuvre. So I think we were just keeping it safe. And, you know, our, our usual goal for this event was a second is, 
is what we're targeting. You know, we right now we'd probably, yeah, it'd be great to get a point back from Santee, but we also don't want the boat behind to get by us. And I think if you're targeting, you know, top tens at the first mark and targeting a second, you know, a top five or, you know, a second or so in the racing, um, you're going to be in good shape by the end of the week. And as you said, it has become very processional in this race. Luckily for you, you're well, more than luckily, uh, you've put yourself in the right position and you've, uh, you've got on the front of the train. Well, I think what this race has really showed is that, you know, you have to go the right way out of the blocks. There were some races in Geelong where there was opportunities and avenues to get back into the racing, but you know, if you weren't going the right way and check out this job set here by the, the British, that was, um, pretty impressive to be able to turn inside those two boats and no they haven't passed those guys yet but they're definitely putting a lot of pressure on um on, on the danish there but i think what this race really highlights is how important it is to get out of the start and go the correct way because it was often a bit of a it was a one-way track but it was never the same one way you know if you look at the racing on this course in two hours when the 49ers went out there it was all left on the track. I could see the race course from where I was staying and um, I couldn't understand why all the 49ers were going left ley line when we were so dominant on the right. And um, that's the cool thing about sailing. You know, you, you have to really live for the 30 minutes at a time um, for how long the race goes for. How important was your homework before the start of this race? It's essential. You know, it doesn't matter which race you're in. It's the reason why we're in the top three right now is not because we did anything special. We basically just did a lot of homework. We never switched off while that sea bruise was developing. And it was like, we need to make sure that we go the right way. And the right way is getting it onto port tack and getting out right. And once you do that and you've sailed for a minute, you just take a massive deep breath and relax and go, okay, this one's going to be easy because everyone's more or less got the same skills in the boats. The boats go more or less the same speed. But once you're ahead, it's really hard to, to get passed by people, um, particularly when it's a, a bit of a one-way track. Do you do that homework with another boat? Were you doing split tacks or any of that? In, in Geelong, we were sort of operating a bit solo. Um, so we, we had our coach with us, who Harry, who um, – He's from Melbourne, so he's done quite a bit of time in Geelong. And he actually, funnily enough, he worked in Geelong for the last two years in a um, – he work as? He's an engineer and he was designing carbon fibre wheels for race cars in Geelong. He's, he's from Melbourne. Anyway, he, he has quite a lot of knowledge of Geelong and he understands how the, the weather systems work there. So there was a lot of discussion all the time by us about the weather and um, – what type of day it's going to be and a lot of homework done before races. He'd basically drive around and find all the weed patches for us and measure a lot of wind strength from one side to the other. And we'd be just getting angles on our compass and exploring um, corners of the race course so that we could, um, you know, just get off on the right foot out of the blocks. And we did a lot of development on um, our sailing skills and also our upwind foiling, um, which I think, you know, also gave us, you know, saved us a lot of points. We were, we were quite fast when we could foil up wind. And, um, you know, once we were able to do that, you're able to really go the right way with confidence that you're also going quite fast. And how much do you think we might see that upwind foiling at Tokyo 2021, the games? I think if we get off offshore breeze, um, it'll, it'll feature quite highly. Okay. Um, I remember going to Japan in 2018 for the, for the testament. There you go. There's Santi taking the race win and we followed up with the second. So it was, um, it was a really good day, this one for us. But to go back to your question, I think that so let's when talk, we were there in 2018. So, it's, so let, let's just finish off this race here a little bit. Yeah. So, yep. so yeah, you were second across fairly comfortably ahead of the Americans crossing in third. Uh, so uh, what, what would be the conversation that you and Haley would have straight after that race? Yeah, so for us straight after that race, um, it's the end of the day, so we're heading home. So we were basically just saying, you know, we were, we were very happy with the day. Obviously, this was our best race of the day as a second. I think our other two results were like a six and a seven or something like that, and we had to do a bit of fighting back. But um, 
I think that we were probably saying it was definitely worth staying out for that one. You know, we sat out there for an hour and a half and um, when you sit around postponed, it's really important to make sure that the race after a postponement is a counter. You know, a lot of our competitors here, you remember how close the British were to us at the bottom mark? We were able to get away from them. So that's really good points for us against, um, against the British. And at this point, I don't think we worked our way into the lead of the regatta, but we were still in the top two, top three. So every day that you're in the hunt for an overall win is, is important. So that was basically the conversation we we're having on the way home. Right. Okay. Um, so just come, I interrupted you talking, we're talking about uh, foiling and um, whether that's going to be applied in Enoshima. It just uh, never ceases to amaze me how quickly the developments move on in this boat. I mean, the, the rate of gain of how people have learned to control these boats on the foils has been phenomenal. Yeah, no, I, honestly, we were just starting to touch on some massive gains, I thought, for Haley and I um, at these worlds. We, we turned a lot of our weaknesses into strengths um, between Auckland and Geelong. And um, you know, this is Tito and Banty here just coming through their finishing line now. Clearly, they must have wow. hooked a lot of weed and not dealt yeah. with it very well because they beat us around the bottom mark before. So that's what I'm saying where some people managed it a lot better than others. They, they I think, threw all that way a lot of points at this event by not really managing weed correctly. Um, what are the Austrians doing there? They surely are not trying to clear weed at this point in the race. <laughs> I think they're a little bit overlaid. <laughs> yeah. But sorry, going back to your point about the upwind foiling, when we were in, in Japan back in 2018, we had, uh, uh, what was it, one of the World Cup events there, and there were two boats that foiled upwind for the first two days. So for six races... Italy uh, 26 and um, Gemma and, and Jason from New Zealand were often hundreds of metres in front of the entire fleet at the first top mark, foiling upwind and, and, and going extremely fast. And um, I just remember looking at this going, Hayley, we need to learn how to do what they're doing. So for almost a year after then, we just focused purely on trying to get upwind foiling to work. And, and I thought oh, we will arrive at some of the events throughout 2019 and everyone will be doing it. And not a single team really showed any upwind foiling um, potential or no one really pushed for it. And when we got to Geelong, we just kept pushing and pursuing it. And, you know, we did a lot of sailing with some other teams. And in training, a lot of people foil. But when it comes to racing, no one's brave enough to actually do it. So the real question will be is, is are people going to keep pushing it and just pull it out for the Olympics or are they, or are they going to just um, let that one slide? Now, tell us why it's brave to have a go at foiling because from the outside you think, well, if you go that much faster, why wouldn't you do it all the time? Well, you, you always take a loss in takeoff because you have to build speed and bear away and get it up and going. And one of the things we focused on was minimising that loss because if you minimise the loss on takeoff, um, then instantly you're into the gaining straight away. It's, it's, it's also difficult to sail the boat foiling. You know, it takes a lot more um, focus. So you could miss wind shifts or miss ley lines if you're fully focused on foiling. And you also sail a lower mode. So if you are foiling on a header, um, you're going to do a lot of distance. So basically foiling really works when you're in a lifted piece of pressure. The water's flat enough that it's easy enough to do it and you can gain from it. But the other big downside to foiling upwind is that in able, in, to be able to foil upwind, you have to set the boat up in a way that makes the boat extremely difficult to sail downwind foiling. You know, the, 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 the settings that you used on the rudders and the dagger boards mean that downwind gets incredibly difficult. And so that's why I feel like it's, um, it's going to be a, it's, there's always a compromise, you know. You, and our theory was is if you got to the top mark in the first few boats, you can deal with the downwind, but if you get there in the middle of the fleet, it's very hard to pass boats from there. Now, uh, we've looked at that race specifically. I want to come back to you another time and, and maybe talk about the broader campaign that you've just completed, but just tell us how this world's finished up for you because um, you, you did sail a phenomenal regatta. So just sum up the whole regatta in Geelong for us. Yep, so, so the, the, we, we basically finished the qualifying series or the entire racing series with, a I think it was a 13-point lead 
Um, so we, we managed to, the following day, stretch the lead a little bit further. And so Jason Waterhouse and Lisa Dunman and the other Australian team were second going into the medal race and um, the British team were in, in third. And so we had a, a pretty good buffer on both those boats and, um, and, the, and the British team in that race managed to, to get clear and, and, and get out into the lead and, and our focus, you know, shifted more towards Olympic selection as opposed to winning the Worlds when it got to that medal race um, to try and ensure that we were the top Australian there. And so we had a, a bit of a race where we, you know, were really focused on Jason and Lisa. And in the end, um, we slipped to second on the podium and they dropped to third and, and John and Anna took the win by, um, I think it was, again, one point. So Haley and I now have had two second places in the last three Worlds um, losing by one point on both occasions. So, you know, that was our last race in the NACA because after that Olympic selection went to Jason and Lisa. So I guess our strategy for the medal race ended up being incorrect because um, it was a discretionary decision. But, um, you know, I think Haley and I are very proud that we were second twice, but probably also just as disappointed that we never got to stand on the top step in the class. What always amazed me was the year that you jumped in speculatively and initially just to help out Haley with her campaign and you were going to do a bit of coaching and thought you'd get in the boat just to see what it feels <laughs> like um, and then stayed in the boat. You, you end up coming second and just missing the world title in your first year in, in the boat. And I remember seeing you at uh, Keel Week just a little more than a month before the world's in Aarhus and you were still getting to grips with the basics of the boat. Um, and uh, yep. so that, that was a phenomenal inaugural year that you had in the NACRA. Um, I mean, obviously it's, it's very, uh, Jason and Lisa, they were unlucky uh, to, uh, to miss out on Olympic gold in Rio. They are a class act. You know that, I know that. Um, but now that the the whole um, Olympics has been pushed back another year to July 2021, how frustrated are you that you haven't had an opportunity to keep on extending your skills, you and Haley? So it's a good question. Like, you know, without question, you know, Jason and Lisa are fantastic sailors and, you know, to get two thirds in the last two worlds has, has been extremely impressive by them. I think for Haley and I, we've had, you know, a, a, an interesting kind of um, NACRA journey. You know, we started with little to no experience in the class. And um, as you said, you know, in Kiel, we're like deers in the headlights on how we sort of race and sail this thing. And, you know, we, we had a very good Worlds in Aarhus coming second. And um, a lot of that probably was because of our Olympic sailing experience, not so much foiling and the, the NACRA itself. And then throughout 2019, we sort of struggled to get time on the water due to other, you know, commitments, you know, what I had going on with Sal GP and also having, you know, my first son, you know, it was, wasn't a whole lot of time. So we didn't really get much time in the boat, but we were able to ramp up quite a lot over the, the, the Auckland and Geelong worlds. And I think we started to really unlock a lot of things for us in the class. And when Geelong finished, we were like, man, if we knew a year ago what we know now, um, we would be just on fire. And we had a very, very long list of things that we knew we were going to go away and work on. And um, we had, you know, a very good plan on what we needed to do in that six months to get ready for the Olympics, should we were being selected. And um, now that there's another year on top of that, I just think, man, there's so much left on the table. You know, for Haley and I, there's so much development that we were just starting to scratch the surface on in Geelong. And, you know, every time we put week after week of sailing together, the, the gains were massive. So it's a bit frustrating to not be able to do that. Um, but, you know, that's life. You don't always get your chances. I've been to three Olympics. It's um, It's been very um, enjoyable experience. And I think um, this one will be the one that, you know, got away, I guess. Well, with all that in mind, Nathan, and it's it's not that long ago that Geelong happened. Um, it's really generous of you to get on this call and and talk about this because it, it must be a little bit bittersweet um, seeing you, yourself come second in that regatta in in that race just then, and 
ending up second in the regatta. There's there's lots more I'd like to ask you. I think we'll come back to that another time. Um, yeah, any, any time. Happy to happy to chat about things. There's there's not much going on around here. As I said to to my wife, I said I'm going a bit crazy. You know, I can't go on the water here in New Zealand at all. And um, there's only so much viewing you can do of old races where you wish you had done things differently. But um, always happy to have a chat. Always love talking to you. Thanks very much, Nathan, and stay safe down in NZ. More well done, thanks.